Hello and welcome to this edition of the Assignment Journey podcast. I'm Naomi from the Skills Team. The keen-eared amongst you may have noticed that I am not Alex. Um, Alex has been doing this assignment podcast series, but he's unable to be here for this recording, so you've got me instead. And Alex has had to leave the podcast in my hands. Um, Again, regular listeners will know that Alex and I sometimes differ on what should be included and what shouldn't be included in a podcast. You would be amazed all the things that Alex has cut out of (laughs) my my insight and wisdom that get edited out of these podcasts. Um, But I do admit sometimes I can go off at a bit of a tangent so I'm going to record this and then give it to Alex to edit so who knows you may not get to hear this I don't know Um, but our assignment journey podcast so last episode the most recent episode was talking about researching your topic so finding journal articles finding books how you're going to find the right things that you want and this podcast is talking about organizing that and adding research into a structure i've got a guest for this podcast it's not just going to be me talking the whole time uh my lovely colleague emma is going to be joining me um for part of it some of it's going to be me just talking but emma's going to be joining me as well so you can look forward to that we've also got student voices as per usual and the information that we've got from social media so why is it important to organize your research it's one of those questions that on some ways feels really obvious but actually is worth it it bears a closer examination so why is it important to organize your research i think the the best way to approach that question is what would the consequence be if you didn't organize your research um if you've got no idea of what you've read when where why how it's going to be a lot more challenging when you come to pull that into your assignment. I think that would be true for for the vast majority of people. What can students gain by organising their work? I think that's going to be... It is going to be different for individual students, what you gain from organising, what you're reading as you go along. For me, I gain... The, I, I gain time. I gain time by organising my work. So the more I'm organised as I go along with my research, with my finding journal articles, what I'm reading, the more time I win at the end when I come to write my reference list, for example, or when I come to pull it into my assignment plan, into my structure. Um, the, like I say, if it's there, easy to find, I know what I'm doing, I've got all the information I need, then I have saved time. Um, when I was a student, I remember some some very stressful times trying to scrabble around finding references and finding where something was published. So I really feel like I would have gained a lot as a student from organising the articles and the books that I'd been reading. We've got some student voices, so we're going to play those. Um, we've also got some submissions through our Instagram um, account. Do follow us on Instagram and other social media platforms. On Instagram, we put out questions so that you have this real opportunity to contribute to these podcasts. We put out the question yesterday. I'm recording the podcast today, so it will get used. We will read it. Um, so do follow us at Derby Uni Library and the Instagram and Twitter, both at Derby Uni Library. So we'll listen to the student voices now. I'll then talk about what came through Instagram and we will resume shortly. So how do you organise your research? I would organise it into keywords uh, uh, related to the essay that I was expected to write and then look up those keywords themselves. Uh, I make a Word document with different headings so I can categorise the research accordingly. So after writing my essay structure, each area of the essay structure, for example, the introduction, will be allocated a specific colour, for example, pink. And as I go through my research, when I find something that is apparent to that part, then I will highlight it in pink and tab it pink so that I can make quick reference when I'm writing. Right, so firstly, I look up for information and I get all the information in in a document and then I'll just go over again and edit the highlights. I'll take the important bits uh, and then at the end, I'll uh, just write a conclusion based on what I've written so far, yeah. I use a research tool called Zotero, but there's also JustArt where I can save different cases and journals um, in different folders and it's available on all the computers as well. 
um, I download um, some articles and you know save them into uh, PDF forms. And then uh, with books, I'll put some stick notes and you know highlight it if possible. So we had some of our student voices there um, using keywords related to the assignment. I love that because sometimes it can be so easy to use keywords without really thinking through why those words are key. Um, the, the clues in the name, they, they are keywords. They are key because they're related to your assignment. I think that's a brilliant idea. And also using a Word document with headings again, bringing that structure, that organisation. Um, when we listen to the conversation I've just had with Emma, we'll talk about different ways that you can use technology to organise your references. Um, or non-technology, depending on how you're feeling or works what works best for you so what came through our instagram question um, make a document with all your quotes analysis and referencing information so again i'm guessing people are talking about a word document there although maybe excel as well and um, you could use write down all the details you need for referencing as you go so key like i say you don't want to be scrabbling at the end trying to find the referencing details make little color coordinated sections in your notebook for each book you read i think that's good i mean i'm always i love the idea of color coding i love the idea of i like things that look pretty i like things that look engaging i just can't bring myself to do it i don't have the i don't think about things in a visual way that would let me color code effectively i like the effect of it i like it looking pretty but i don't think about things in a visual way color coding doesn't um doesn't help me at all um, start early that's an awesome piece of advice save journals with sensible and helpful names so you can find them again isn't that brilliant do you know when you download a journal article and often the file name will be some random collection of numbers letters who knows it does something that doesn't make sense so actually taking the time it'll only take you 30 seconds when you save it just to change that file name with a sensible and helpful name and those are good words, sensible and helpful, um, so you can find them again. That feels like a really top piece of advice. And save them into one place so they don't get lost again. Again, these are things that might seem straightforward when you say them, but actually so easy to not do. So it's always worth um, bearing these things in mind when you are, um, when you're doing your, your reading and when you're trying to, to record what you've done. I think this will be a good time to listen to the conversation I've had with Emma. We covered lots of um, aspects of this and particularly, like I say, different methods and systems that you can use both paper-based and technological to keep track of those references. We talked about colour coordination as well in there. So, Emma. Okay, um, my name's Emma Butler and I'm the Research Liaison Manager for the Library which sounds like quite a fancy title, it but does. really what it means is making sure that particularly our research students, our PhD students and our research staff have access to the library resources and services and support that they need as well. But it's not just, it's primarily aimed at those groups of um, University of Derby colleagues, but we also support students across a wide range of programmes with sort of organising, managing and um, helping with their research as well. I can do a really good link here because um, my husband did a PhD. I may have mentioned this before in podcast. Perfect. I may not. Anyway, <laughs> he did a PhD, but he did it last minute because okay, obviously. Yeah. Um, and he had lots of references because you do for a PhD. His... 80,000 words. Yes, yes. he'd read a lot of journal articles. Mm. He had not organised his references in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. So... I personally wow, had, to you had, you had to sit down and do it all. last minute and he was using footnotes, I had to do all his footnotes, I had to do his reference oh, list. Oh my word. Um, so I would have appreciated it if he had organised himself oh. more along the way. So talk to me about that. Okay, so as you say, sort of doing, doing any piece of work actually, right mm. from sort of an essay um, assignment right through to doing a dissertation, a PhD thesis, you do gather an enormous amount of information, an enormous mm. amount of references. Some of those you will use, some of those you will cite within your body of work, others will be used to inform your thinking and inform your direction. But anything that you use, even those that do inform your thinking, you may need to um, reference those, you may yeah. need to make people who are marking your work aware of what you have used. So it's really important that you keep track of what you have you know read what you what has sort of particularly what sort of informed that thinking and your direction of your work and 
there's sort of various ways to do that. It's usually better to do it right from the start. Yes. Note to husband. My, yes. <laughs> my, my worst was when I used to read something and I think... I'd make like half a note, maybe one sentence. And then yeah. I think, I'm never going to use this. That. I'm not going to worry. And then I'd think, oh, yeah. suddenly it would become this really key sentence. Yeah. And I've not written down any, any of the information. Yeah. It's like pouring really back to all these <laughs> yes. books, aren't you? Where did I find I know it was a blue book. And yeah. I know it, yeah. And I borrowed it from the library. Um, so yeah, so sort of doing it right from the start mm. is kind of best piece of advice that I can that I can give really and there's so many different ways of doing it now I know that when I did my dissertation for my masters I went old school and I had um, a series of cards like you know sort of postcards and I wrote on those postcards I wrote all the information that I needed Mm. um, to you know do my references but I also did write sort of a little bit of detail about what I had read as well and where I might use it. So I went old school, you know, people use notebooks, uh, people use Excel spreadsheets. There's a wide range of different sort of methods that people use to keep track of their references. Some people just have sort of a Word document. Um, But there are sort of lots of things that can help you. Um, Commonly known as reference management software. So some of the key ones that you might have heard of are um, EndNote, which is the University of Derby supported reference management software. There's Mendeley, there's Satiro, the site you like, which are free ones that you can use and access yes. as well. EndNote you'd have to pay for, wouldn't you? But the library subscribes the, to it. Yeah, the so university you, subscribes yeah. to it on your behalf. So, and with all of these, it's basically a case of as you go through, as you're doing your reading, you add the reference to that piece of software and then um, they're sort of all um, collected, stored for you and then you can then insert them into your work as well as you are writing so you have your sort of reference there um, and sort of it can be formatted in the style that you need as well. Yeah, does it do the, the, put the citation in the reference? your reference list together so yes like, it does yeah, yeah. yeah so if you're doing harvard um it will insert the citation where you need it um in the correct format and then add the reference certainly end it will add the reference at the end of your piece of work mm. as well and usually with most of them you can add a pdf of the article um to kind of the piece of software as well so you've got that com- kind of complete package mm. of the information that you have used, uh, which can be sort of really, really helpful when it comes to, you know, sort of writing your references, when it comes to evidencing where you've got your thoughts and ideas from. Definitely. Yeah. I think sort of the other thing um, that sort of another method to use, um, a lot of our, certainly a lot of our library databases, so thinking about Library Plus, thinking about a lot of the EBSCO ones, they have a folder feature, so you can store your references in um, folders. I guess they are really useful if you are just going to be using Library Plus or just going to be using yeah. something like um, so one of our EBSCO databases. And you can save all your references within a folder. You can kind of access them. Do you still have to create an account? You do, do still that? have to create an account to yeah. do it. So you log on to um, Library Plus, for example, with your University of Derby username and password, as you do with a lot of our library resources. But then you have to create a separate account yes. in order to access that folder. But anything that you add to that folder will stay there. Yeah. Um, and then you can use that to compile your reference list as well. So. So different people work in different different ways. Yeah. So. Are you a colour coder? Am I co- in what respect? Name so it? when you're organising things like you see you've got all your your journal articles on different topics, and um, do you colour code topics or do you? Not? No, I don't. No, no I'm not a colour coder. No. I, I don't. I, what I did tend to do um, as well is I would print out the first page of like a journal article I was using. Um, so print out just the first page because obviously you know being aware of sustainability and green issues and the cost of printing etc etc but just print out that first page usually on that first page you've got all the information you need for your references Mm. you've also got a bit of an abstract bit of summary bit of the introduction so you know what the article was about and then I used to kind of annotate that as well so I'd have a folder of um journal article first pages that's a good top a tip good top tip that as is. well and it's often very easy to get you could do the same thing you can sort of photocopy the title page of a book or print out the title page of an ebook and then you've got all that information that you need as well mm. or I screenshot guess, or screenshot it yeah and save it and save it you can annotate you know add sticky notes and things mm. um annotate pdfs as well 
the sort of another um, top tip is that if you have used some of our library resources, if you've borrowed books from the library, you can also get access. We can provide you with a list of those books that you've borrowed yes, as definitely. well. I've done that um, when I've been on the counter. Yeah. <laughs> had a student come, like I said, I borrowed a book and it was blue. blue um, and it was about this time. And yeah, yeah I once had a student um, say I borrowed a book and it had a T-shirt on the cover. Did you find it? I did find it. Wow. But only because it had t-shirt in the title. Okay. <laughs> if it hadn't have done, then I don't think I'd have managed it. Um, but yes, yeah, as, as Emma says, you can we can access... And you can, I think, on your library account, I you can go and see can. history yeah. of what you, with images of the covers. Yes, so, so you know, definitely a really good way of finding, you know, if you do remember. And there's nothing yeah. more frustrating than knowing that you need a reference yeah. for something and not being able to find it. The other thing with books, and I say this when I do presentations on citing and referencing, is if in this scenario you've, you've handed the book back in, you've thought you've got everything you need, but you find out actually later you, you need something else from it. Um, much of the bibliographic information, and in most cases all you need for your reference will be on the catalogue. Yeah. So you don't need that physical book back. Go into your library account, find your history, click on the link to the book, yeah. and all that information will be there. The publisher will be there. It will all, it will all be there. So Definitely. And certainly with e-books, you, know, you can access those at any time. Yes. So. And we reference ebooks the same way we reference print books. Yes, we do now. You used to have yeah, to put yeah. like a separate, like an ebook that you had to kind of specify it was an ebook, and you accessed it online and things. But yeah. now, because they're sort of so prevalent now, you kind of do have, you know, it's sort of much freer in terms of referencing. You don't necessarily have to make that distinction because, like you say, the content's the same. <laughs> so, so you know, there's lots, there's lots out there to help you organise mm. um, and manage your references, and also the what you are reading um, to kind of create those references as yeah. well. So there's loads out there to sort of help you manage the information and also your references because it's such a key part yeah. of being a student using information ethically that you do yes. need to make sure that you you know do cite and reference materials yeah. that you've used. I think because there are so many different ways of doing it, you've got to strike a balance because you've got to try. It's always useful to try different things and see what works Definitely, for you. Find yeah. a method because it might be that writing it all out by hand on sheets of paper is what works mm. for you best. And um, so I think there's a balance to be struck between experimenting. But then picking a method and sticking, sticking with, with it, it. yes, definitely. Because I, I love a new idea. So my, I, my, my risk is that I'd start doing one thing, and then halfway through I'd find out about something else that was amazing and start doing that, and then it just gets more complicated. And I think you know it's a really good tip, Naomi, because if you are, um, you know, if you're starting off in year one, what you read, what you use in year one, may inform your thinking mm. later on in that year. You might actually start in year one and have a fantastic idea for something you want to study in depth for your dissertation or perhaps something like um, you know, the Ignite URSS scheme. So to be able to have sort of that catalogue of everything that you've read throughout your university yeah. career can really help you to sort of you know, make sure that you're getting as big a picture of um, sort of the research that's out there as possible. Mm. So yeah. Wonderful. Thank you very much for your time, Emma. Hello, this is back to Naomi, just on herself version of Naomi. You've just heard the conversation I've had with Emma. Hopefully that's given you some insight into some of the tools that you can use. I am back looking at Alex's podcast plan that I am dutifully following. I think we've covered most of the things in the plan, apart from adding notes into a structure. Now, that's a really fascinating topic because it's pulling together different skills. Um, if you've got a structure for your assignment, you've thought and you've planned out what you're doing, how are you going to add those relevant notes in? And I think that all does come back to how you've organised it. So the student voice that said, use keywords related to your assignment. This is where that's going to pay off. If you've used those keywords related to the topic of your assignment, you should be able to then pull that into your structure. So structure and I don't know if this was talked about in the assignment journey podcast last episode. Doing your reading and your research and doing your structure, it can be um, tempting to do one before the other, depending on how you work. But actually, it can be useful to do them sort of alongside each other. The one influences the other. So you might think through a basic structure, which influences what you research, but then what you read might influence your structure. So if there's that dynamic relationship between the two, you should be able to find that your keywords, that you're organising your, um, your references and your 
sources with are relating back to that structure and you can I, i'm picturing this sort of beautiful synergy between the two as you all go away and do your assignment preparation this synergy between what you're reading and what you're thinking about and the structure of your assignment as you're pulling all that together I suppose if you're doing reading, it might be that you've done some reading in preparation for some of your um, your taught sessions um, in the beginning of the course, and then you've been given your assignment title later on, or you've only started thinking about your assignment later on, in which case you're going back to references that, and, and journal articles, books that you've read beforehand, before you were thinking about your assignment. So I guess in that situation, when you're doing that reading before you get to the assignment part, those summaries of what you've read will be really helpful, picking out keywords about what's useful and relevant about that article. Or, as Emma was saying, keeping a copy of the abstract, that might be really helpful to then pull it back into the structure when you come to looking at your assignment. Where might students find resources on organising research? Well, I'm glad you asked that, Alex's podcast plan. I'm glad you asked that. We have a skills guide. You pro might be able to hear the clicking because I'm opening it up because... I can think better when I'm looking at it in front of me. As said before, I'm quite a physical person. Uh, my hands move, I like to look at what I'm doing, I find it very difficult to talk in the abstract. Um, so we have a skills guide called Organising Research and References. So that's basically what we're talking about. We've got information about why you need to learn it, how do you do it, and we've got information about reference management softwares as well. There's a link to EndNote, um, all sorts of things on that guide, so that you can get to library homepage, click on find subject information, and then drop down the skills guides, drop down, and you will get to the relevant guide. That information is current at the moment. So that's answered that question. Hello there, it's Alex here hijacking his own podcast in post-production. So to conclude this podcast, what you have watched is all about organising research. We would recommend that you go and check out now for more information uh, some different online technological ways of organising research. So if you're interested in that, we have an EndNote video available. Uh, as well, check out the skills guide, as Naomi said. Um, but for this podcast, I guess that is it. So for the next podcast, we are going to be talking all about writing the assignment, giving our top tips. I'll be joined by some people from the university, and we'll be talking about how to get flow, how to critically analyse, and also how to structure an assignment, as well as also giving that general advice. So tune in to the next episode. Thank you very much for watching this episode, and I'll be back shortly. Bye.